Welcome back. In the last few videos, we've been uh, experimenting with context-free grammar rules. So we had rules like subject goes to noun phrase, verb phrase, and so forth. And we used those rules to parse sentences in English, in Klingon, and in Tagalog. And with enough rules, you could parse a large quantity of sentences in these languages. And when you've collected enough parsed sentences, thousands, for example, then you could begin to do really cool things. Like, for example, calculating the probability that a sentence could be interpreted in one way versus in a different way. So that's why we're interested in creating large collections of parsed sentences. And these collections are called tree banks. So here we have an example of a CFG grammar in English, where we have uh, rules like a, a sentence is a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and then a noun phrase is a determiner and a noun, for example. Using these rules, which have non-terminals and terminals like we, he, the, that, we can parse sentences like that cold empty sky was full of fire and light. These notes, by the way, are named with a convention called the pen tree bank. And I will include the link to that in a couple of slides. So we can use rules to create parsed versions of English sentences. And with enough time and effort, you could create enough CFG rules so that you can parse pretty much any sentence in the English language. It will take time to make these rules like a lot of time. Uh, the system that Python and NLTK use is based off of a collection of sentences called the pen tree bank. And that collection has approximately almost 30,000 rules to explain the syntax of English sentences. So for example, the rule that we have here is a verbal phrase that goes to a VPV, VBP, which is a verb that's conjugated that's not conjugated, that is in the uh, non-third person. So for example, go, drink, eat, as opposed to goes, drinks, and eats. So that's uh, VPV, VBP, and then prepositional phrase, prepositional phrase, blah, 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 adverbial phrase, prepositional phrase. You need this rule to account for English sentences, for English verbal phrases like go from football in the fall to lifting in the winter to football again in the spring and these sentences are real they do happen these are some of the, some examples of the almost thirty thousand rules in the pantry bank uh, derived from the pantry bank we need these kinds of nps right here for sentences like the state-owned industrial holding company instituto nacional de industria or shearson's easy to film black and white where we stand commercials and these are two types of NPs which need these kinds of rules. So in order to do this, you would first need a part of speech tagger that can tell you whether a word is a noun or a verb. And then you could begin assigning syntactic rules to the sentences. And in time, you will build representations like these, where you have thousands or millions of sentences that are represented in a parsed version. So here we have this, the sentence we saw earlier, that cold empty sky was full of fire and light. And this is a format that's used in the pen tree bank. Here's the parts of speech. Here's the tree bank itself, and it has examples. And I included a link to a list of tree banks for other languages in the world, because many large languages do have tree banks. Um, and obviously we need this kind of uh, database that we need this kind of, of data set first and foremost so we can train a deep learning solution that will do the parsing for us uh, once we have enough thousands of parsings we can have a data set that includes the sentence in english for example or any language and the parsing and so we could train a deep learning system to give to take a sentence as an input and give us the parsing as the output but we cannot train the system unless we have the parsing these are examples from um, the pen tree bank and as you can see they have to deal with all sorts of details of english sentences for example saying mm, 
as in, so how many uh, credit cards have you? I think I'm down to one. So here there's the code for this fluency, for example, saying, uh, mm, and so forth. How do you make tree banks? It takes time, a lot of time. You could do it like we were doing it with the Klingon and the Tagalog, where you first make rules, and then you give sentences to the system so that it will produce an automatic parsing. Then you have a team of people hand correcting the parsings, making sure that they're correct, and when they are wrong, proposing a correction to the rules. And then the cycle repeats again and again. And someday you'll reach to the 30,000 rules that you need to explain a human language. Um, approximately 30,000. Many. And that's one way to do it. A different way to do it would be for you to create the parsings manually. So for you to create several thousand trees like these, maybe hundreds, and um, then ask the computer to auto-extract the rules. So if you have a tree like this, the computer could auto-extract that, for example, a sentence is composed of a noun phrase and a verb phrase, or that a noun phrase contains a pronoun, which is they. So there are ways to automatize parts of the process, but it's always going to require some sort of human input when we start. And it's a very expensive and time-consuming process. These are some examples from languages that are not English. This is from Italian. Um, Se primavera il mio cor generoso soffocasti di spasmi sordi. In, if it's spring, my generous heart suffocates in deaf spasms. Well, how poetic. So as you can see, what matters is that the notes are the same that we were using for English. This is a complement phrase, uh, a verbal phrase, a prepositional phrase, a determiner. It also has some that are language dependent. So for example, um, it has a certain kind of focus phrase that has a certain structure in Italian. English also has focus phrases. Uh, this is a topic phrase. This is an adjectival phrase, which goes after the NP, heart generous. In English, we would have the, a, the adjective phrase here, a generous heart. So the rules are dependent on the structure of Italian in this case. Here's an example from Turkish. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Kutub um, de konuşmama listen. So you should not talk in the library. As you can see, we have sentences, verb phrases, prepositional phrases. And if, by the way, if you speak Turkish, you'll see that the harmony is uh, left in its like general form. So kutub um, de is expressed with just the da morpheme without the harmony. So the harmony is processed in some other stage. This one, the sin, uh, the harmony here is expressed just as high vowel. If you don't speak Turkish, what matters here is that the note, the, the note structure and in general the constituents are very similar across languages. Not identical, but similar. These are examples from Japanese. Inu ga neko oikaketa. The dog chased the cat. And neko uh, oikaketa inu. The dog that chased the cat. And again, we have NPs, VPs, um, other nouns, and so forth. Oh, a final example from Arabic. Uh, we have Hamsun al Sa'ih Zaru Lubnan wa Surya fi Ailul al Mali. So, 50,000 tourists visited Lebanon and Syria last September. Again, we have a sentence, noun phrases verb phrases, verbs, and um, noun phrases, and so forth. So this is a system that can be used for any human language. And as you can see, it, um, it will take time, but we can explain the structure of sentences in this way. How do we know it's getting this right? How can we evaluate a parser and the set of rules that we made? There's several ways to do it, as with all of our methods, but uh, the one that's mentioned on the textbook is a very popular one called parse eval. It has the two measurements that we've studied before, precision and recall. And precision is the number of constituents that are the same between our prediction with the computer and the gold standard. So the one that we know is correct. So how many constituents match between these two structures? 
divided by how many constituents there are in my predicted sentence. Recall is how many constituents match between my prediction and the gold standard <coughs> divided by all the constituents in the gold standard. Let's look at a very brief example. Let's say we have these parsings here. So the gold standard, what we're aiming for, has W as the primary node, and W is composed of non-terminals X and Y. X goes to the terminal A, Y goes to the non-terminals Z and V, the non-terminal Z goes to the terminal B, V goes to C and D. So these are the labels of nodes, and, these term and then we have the terminals here. We, this is what we were supposed to get. However, what the system gave us, its prediction, was W as the primary node, as the head, and then we have X, Y, and Z. For example, X goes to the terminal A, and so forth. So in our, predict in our predicted tree, in the prediction that our system made, we have in a, um, a node, that, a constituent, that has the label X, and that has the yield a. So these are all the terminals that uh, are connected to the label X, to the non-terminal X. So X yields A. The label Y yields B. The label Z yields C and D. And the label W yields the terminals A, B, C, and D. So these are the four constituents that we have in our predicted tree. Our gold standard is slightly different. There's some of them that are the same. For example, the label A X yields terminals A, just one terminal. Um, the label W yields A, B, C, and D. So these two match. The other ones do not. For example, we have here the label Z, which yields the terminal B. We have the label V, which yields the terminal C and D. So what we need to figure out to calculate these is how many of them match. So these two constituents are present, this constituent, I'm sorry, is present in both the prediction and the gold standard, so it matches. This one is two. The, w, uh, the constituent label W has the yield A, B, C, D in both of them, so they match. These three do not match. So the precision is how many matched two divided by how many uh, constituents I have in my prediction. So how many constituents in my prediction were actually relevant? Two out of four, 50%. Then we have recall, which is all of the matching constituents divided by the number of constituents in the gold standard. So how many of the uh, constituents that are predicted actually mattered for the representation I was aiming for. Only two out of five, 40%, because it's these two, and then these three in the gold standard were not seen by the prediction. By the way, we can also use the F-score, which is, uh, as we studied week five, I think, this is the uh, beta equals two, which means balance the precision and accuracy, Precision multiplied by accuracy multiplied by 2 divided by precision plus accuracy is 44%. So as you can see, the performance of whichever system produced this prediction is not very good. But that way, we can measure the precision for a collection of trees, thousands of trees, and we can know the performance of our parser. One final thing. And I know everyone who took Ling1 is like terrorized that I've been using structures with three branches. So far, we have been using rules that are nary, meaning that they go from one non-terminal to multiple non-terminals. For example, I could go from the non-terminal A and produce a, B, C, D, which is essentially what I'm doing when I say that a verb phrase goes to a non-terminal verb, a non-terminal noun phrase, and a non-terminal prepositional phrase. This is a ternary rule because it goes from one to three. The people who studied Ling1 have only studied binary rules at most. They've studied rules in the Chomsky normal form, which only really have two forms. Binary, where you have one non-terminal going to two non-terminals. So a sentence is a noun phrase and a verb. Um, 
and or for example a noun phrase is a determiner and a noun or a sub noun phrase so you've studied binary rules and you also have unary rules which go from a non-terminal to a terminal and this one is noun goes to house verb goes to walks Many, uh, the theory that you studied, which is most likely government and binding, uses these kinds of rules, Chomsky normal form. The truth is, when uh, for the parsing rules are used in uh, the computational linguistic side, they are kept as theoretically agnostic as possible. For the simple reason that there's many syntactic theories in linguistics, and there's only within Choms the Chomsky tradition, um, government and binding principles and parameters minimalism merge within the generative tradition we also have hbsg we have lfg lexical functional grammar um and that's discounting all of the actually functional traditions so there's so many um different ways in which you can do syntax that if you have a representation that is entry you can then convert that representation onto other formats, including the Chomsky normal form. So any, any entry grammar can be converted into a CNF. And we sometimes use CNF because they're more efficient. They can be parsed quicker. And there's algorithms such as CYK, uh, which produce parsings, that can run on Chomsky normal forms. The explanation for CYK is in your textbook. In summary, we can make we can use our rules to parse a sentence and then another and then another. And after we've parsed many of them, we will have a collection of parsed sentences or a tree bank. In this case, we have been using constituency parsing because our parsings are made of the constituents. They're also called phrase structure parsing because we're using phrase structure rules, which are based on constituents. When we have these, we can measure how well we are doing by using metrics such as precision and recall and measure and making sure that our labels such as NP and our yield, our terminals, are what we are expecting. Um, we make rules that try to be as theory agnostic as possible. And that's why we have what, it, what the linguist would think is such an older form of the rules from the 50s where you can have them go be entry. However, this is because these entry rules can easily be converted into other formats, including binary rules or Chomsky normal forms. In the next few videos, we're going to look at why we want tree banks, which is that we can use them to calculate the probability of certain parsing trees versus other parsing trees, and we will use these to, result amb to resolve ambiguity.